In this segment, we're going to now consider two objections to the knowledge norm. So the first objection might be that maybe there's something just special about lottery cases, and maybe we shouldn't be generalizing too much to our account of assertion just from lottery cases. I think this isn't too implausible a thought, given that we, everything we've already seen with lotteries, we've spent a lot of time thinking about them and we've seen that they have certain kinds of special features. So that, you might wonder about the wisdom of basing the argument for the knowledge norm exclusively on lottery cases. Williamson's reply here is that in a certain kind of way, you can extend the argument to apply to other kinds of subject matters. So you can run this lottery argument that knowledge is the norm of assertion, even for other subject matters that aren't explicitly about lotteries. And the way to do it is just to sort of correlate in some way, set up the case so that the truth of a certain claim that you're interested in uh, is connected to whether a certain ticket is going to win or lose the lottery. So Williamson gives a kind of abstract argument here. I'm going to give you a specific case to fill in the details, but you'll see, I think, basically the idea of how the argument is supposed to work. So again, let's suppose that we're in a lottery situation. You all have bought tickets in the lottery. Again, we can suppose there's a thousand tickets or a million tickets, however you want. Let's also imagine that the, the lottery has also happened and I know the results. So that's one set of facts. Let's also assume that you're interested in the answer to a particular question. Let's imagine you want to know whether your friend Arthur has been spreading rumors about you. Uh, now I want to tell you the answer, but I'm sworn not to literally tell you the answer. I can't just tell you what's going on. So I devise an alternative system. Uh, what I do is that I write the true answer to the question on every losing ticket, and I write the false answer on the winning ticket. So let's suppose that Arthur hasn't been spreading rumors about you. I've written that on all the losing tickets, and I've written on the winning ticket that he is spreading rumors about you. Okay, so what I've done is I've established a kind of correlation between whether a ticket is a losing ticket or not, and the answer to the question. So the true answer to the question is written on the losing tickets. The false answer to the question is written on the winning ticket. And let's suppose that you know all of this. Okay, so you look at your ticket, you turn it over, you see what's written on it. And you see on it is written that Arthur is not spreading rumors about you. So now you have excellent reason to believe that it is indeed true that Arthur isn't spreading rumors on you because you know what the convention I was using was. You know that I wrote something on the ticket, um, or I wrote the truth on the ticket, just in case it was a losing ticket. Moreover, you know that it's overwhelmingly likely that your ticket is a losing ticket. So putting these together, you should now conclude it's overwhelmingly likely that Arthur is not spreading rumors about you. That's just a good piece of probabilistic reasoning, given that you know the connection between what's written on your ticket and it's and whether it's a, w a winner or a loser, and just the odds of you being a winner. So now we've set up a situation where you have excellent reason to believe that Arthur isn't sp sp spreading rumours about you. Your evidence for believing that is just as good as whatever your evidence for believing that your ticket is a loser. Now, of course, like before, you don't, you can't know the answer on your ticket. Because here, your evidence that Arthur isn't spreading rumours about you is purely probabilistic, just like your, your evidence for thinking your ticket is a loser is, prob is purely probabilistic. So given that you can't know the result of the lottery just based on the odds, you're also not going to be in a position to now know that Arthur is not spreading rumours about you. You have excellent evidence to believe it, i.e. the odds are overwhelming in, in its favour, given what you know about the case, but you can't know it for exactly the same reasons that you can't know that your ticket is a loser. So as before, now that we've established your epistemic position with respect to the proposition that Arthur isn't spreading rumours, we got to ask, well, what can you say in response to the question, is he spreading rumours? And just like before, where we saw that you don't want to say that you can straight out assert that your ticket is a loser, at best, you can say it's probable or it's extremely likely. It looks like the same thing goes for this other proposition, this ordinary proposition about whether Arthur is spreading rumours about you. You can't just say, no, he isn't, on the basis of 
seeing that that's what was written on your ticket. Because again, like before, you don't know that, even though you maybe now know it's extremely likely. Again, it looks like the best thing that you can say is, well, it's extremely unlikely that he's spreading rumours about me, or something to that effect. So what we've done is we've, we've shown that by just simply setting up the case in the right way, we can connect facts about lotteries to facts about just un ordinary mundane propositions. And we've shown that the sort of whatever's going on in the original lottery case seems to spill over into the other case. In the original lottery case, it's merely being extremely likely that your ticket was going to lose is not enough for you to be able to assert it. We've seen some evidence to think that with respect to ordinary propositions, the same is true. Because we set up the situation in, in, in a way that guaranteed you had, you should think it's extremely likely that Arthur isn't spreading rumours. And yet we saw that even though it was extremely likely, just as likely as you were going to lose, it didn't look like you were able to assert flat out that Arthur isn't spreading rumours. So that's some reason to think that the lottery phenomenon, it's not specific to the subject matter of lotteries. It can spill out into over it can spill over into other things, because we can simply set up the case in such a way to guarantee that your evidence about an ordinary subject matter is exactly as strong or exactly as weak depending on how you want to think about it, as your evidence in lottery cases. And whether you're, you see, you're able to assert this ordinary proposition seems to march directly in line with where, whether you're able to assert the lottery proposition. The second objection we'll consider says that the knowledge norm is too demanding because essentially you're not always in a position to tell whether you know something or not. In particular, you may fail to know something that you believe even though maybe you have good reason to think that you do know it. So there are two different kinds of examples of when this might happen to you. One kind of case is where you have excellent reason to believe something is the case, um, and yet you get unlucky and it turns out to be false. In this kind of situation, you fail to know just because knowledge entails truth. If you know something, it must be true. So if it turns out to be false, then you can't know it. And in such a situation, you turn out not to have knowledge, even though from your point of view, it might seem like you have excellent reason to believe that you do know something, because you have excellent reason to believe that it's true, and you know that you believe it. The other kind of case that you can use for this argument that we won't focus on it is Gettier cases. So we saw that in Gettier cases, you have excellent reason to believe something. It is in fact true, um, but you turn out not to know it because your belief is not connected to the truth in the right way. Again, in this situation, you might think that it's extremely reasonable for you to think that you know the thing that you believe. However, as we saw in Gettier cases, it turns out you, that you don't know such things. So this will be another case in which what is reasonable for you to believe that you know turns out to be different from what you in fact know. And the argument, the reason why this is relevant is because we got to think, well, what happens when you assert something in cases where you don't know it, but it's very reasonable for you to believe that you do know it. So here would be such a case. So imagine that you tell me it's raining outside and I come to believe you. As a matter of fact, you're lying to me. It isn't raining outside. But you've always been honest in the past and I've no particular reason to suspect that you'd be lying in this case. So I come to believe what you've told me. Now in such a situation, it looks like I have a justified belief. From my point of view, I'm doing exactly what I should be doing. The belief that I form is exactly the belief that I should be forming, given the evidence I have. Rather, what's happening is that I've gotten unlucky. Even though this is what I should believe, I can't amount to knowing it because it turns out to be false, because my evidence was misleading in this case. Okay, so in this, this is a case where I maybe have reason to think I know it, because I know what my evidence for it is, I know that you're usually reliable, but it turns out I don't know it because it's false. Now imagine I go and tell a bunch of other people that it's raining. Here I've told them something I don't know, because I can't know it, because it's false. Now it looks, if you remember what the knowledge norm says, that as a consequence, I've done something I shouldn't have done. I've inserted improperly, because remember what the knowledge norm says, it says, assert something only if you know it. Here I've asserted something that I failed to know. 
So it looks like, as a consequence, the, assert the knowledge norm assertion is going to say, I've asserted something I shouldn't have asserted. I've asserted it incorrectly. Why is this a problem? Well, because you might think that from the point of view of correct or incorrect assertion, I haven't actually done anything wrong in this situation. For instance, even when it turned out to be false, maybe that's raining. Once you got clear on why I said the thing I did, it's hard to say, it's hard to see that you would blame me for saying what I did. To bring it out even a little bit more, suppose that we turned out to be false, it would be very strange for you to turn around and criticize me by saying, why did you say something you didn't know? The obvious response would be to say, I didn't, well, as far as I knew, it was true. And that seems to be enough. We might think, well, that shows that you haven't asserted improperly. You have a very good defense for your behavior if somebody tried to, to critique what you did. So this might be troubling for the people who like the knowledge norm. It's not obvious that you have done anything wrong here, but the knowledge norm says that you have. It's worth mentioning as an aside that it's this kind of case that maybe still persuades some people that it's really a justification norm that we want. Because obviously, if, it's a, if we think in terms of a justification norm, it's very clear that you've done nothing wrong in this situation. The justification norm says, assert only what you have justified beliefs for. I clearly have, I'm justified in believing it's raining, even if I don't know that in this situation. From the, so from the point of view of the justification norm, I've done nothing wrong. However, Williamson has an answer for what the knowledge norm can say here as well. And basically the answer is that we should distinguish between cases where you've done something wrong and you're blameworthy, and cases where you've done something wrong but you have some kind of excuse. So here's maybe a kind of case to get you in the mind mindset here. So imagine that I'm preparing dinner for you, I put some oil in the pan, or at least what I think is oil, and that the bottle is marked, that it's olive oil, but imagine it, it turns out actually to contain poison in it. Now I don't know that. Let's imagine the poison has been slipped in while I haven't been looking. So what I've in amount done is I've ended up cooking and serving you a poison meal. You might think that in this situation, I've my action is wrong, or I've done something wrong in a case like this. But even if you think that, it's pretty clear that I'm not blameworthy. Because I didn't know there was poison. In fact, I've no reason to suspect I've every reason not to suspect there was poison. It's pretty unusual for bottles of olive oil to be poisoned. It's not the kind of thing I should expect. It's not the kind of thing that I would be blameworthy for unless I had checked. So you might think this is a kind of case where you've done something wrong, but nonetheless you have an excuse, so you're not blameworthy. So this would be a case of the second kind we said that would maybe suggest that just because you do something wrong, that it would not immediately follow that you're blameworthy for what you've done. And if such a distinction exists, then Williamson can obviously apply it in the assertion case as well. The idea would be that, well, maybe as strictly speaking, you did do something wrong in asserting that it was raining because you didn't know it. But there are cases and cases. There are cases where you do something wrong and you're blameworthy for it. And you're, blame, you're blameworthy particularly because you see that you were violating the norm when you did it. But there are cases maybe where you're not blameworthy because from your point of view, it seemed like you were following the norm. And in such cases, you have an excuse. So what we might say about these cases where you lack knowledge, but it doesn't, it's not obvious to you that you lack knowledge, is that you have an excuse for doing something wrong because it seemed reasonable to you that you were in fact following the norm. How plausible you really think this response is, is going to come down a lot to how plausible you think the initial distinction is. Do you think it's plausible that there's a difference between cases where you do something wrong and you're blamable, and cases where you do something wrong and you're not blamable? One response might be there just is no distinction. You might think in the poison case, you didn't do anything wrong. Um, and you didn't do anything wrong because, for all you knew, you were serving up a normal meal and not a poisoned one. So how convincing this response is depends a lot on whether you like this distinction. And you might worry that people who like justification norms, not just on assertion, but on other things, aren't going to find those other cases any more convincing. They'll probably just say, in the other cases, well, these are also cases where you did nothing wrong because you were justified in doing what you did, even though it turned out to be bad.